Well, welcome to week one of our new sermon series, the book of James. If we could get a little house lights, I would appreciate that. Audrey? Audrey, sweet love? If we can get a little house lights, I'd like to see a little better. Today we're going to be in verses 1 through 12. Next week we're still going to be in James chapter 1. We're going to take the very next block of scripture, verses 13 through 18. The third week, we are going to pause because I have asked a a very special guest to speak into your lives. Uh, Pastor Dave Gordon, he's from another church, and I'll tell you more in a few weeks why I wanted him here, Uh, but in uh, three weeks, I want you to be here. He's going to speak into your life. And then the fourth week, uh, we're still going to be in James chapter 1, okay? So we're going to be in James chapter 1 for about four weeks or so. There is five chapters, but there's so much, I honestly didn't want to skim over it, so we're going to sit in the scriptures for about 11 weeks. Okay, we're just going to soak it in, we're going to savor it, and next week, I'm going to offer you a challenge, a Bible reading challenge and a media fast challenge. I'll talk about that next week, something I'm going to do, and I'm going to invite you in to that. So if you're here next week, I'll share that with you. Well, there are 66 books in the Bible, and they either talk about the way to God or your walk with God. Okay, the book of James talks about your walk with God. And it actually doesn't get into a lot of doctrinal things, okay? You don't see a lot about sin or salvation or the gospel. And the reason is because he's writing as if you get that already. Okay, so James is assuming that you get all of that stuff. And his message is basically, okay, if you believe all this stuff, act like it. That's what James is doing in this book. So he's a straight talker. Good, Teresa said. You must be a straight talker. Todd isn't here, but I would affirm that with him. If... Do we have any straight talkers in the house? Lapita, yes, you are for sure. <laughs> Sandy, mm-hmm. My wife is a straight talker. I don't know if you know that. And I really do appreciate it. But it also stresses me out sometimes. (laughs) There's times where I'm having a bad day. You know, I'm tired. And she'll be straight talking me. And I'll say, babe, I really appreciate it. But I'm tired today. Today I just need you to be kind. And she'll be like, no, you need me to be iron. Iron sharpens iron. I made up that scenario, but that's pretty much what happens. James is a straight talker. And so I'm going to share with you who James is, uh, who he's writing to, and why this is important for you. Okay, not the person sitting next to you, but for you. And the opening verse of James chapter 1 makes this clear. James, okay, there's the writer, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Now, we'll see why they're scattered among the nations in a minute. But this is James, and he is the half-brother of Jesus. He's family to Jesus. We know this because in Matthew 13, we see, coming to his own hometown, Jesus began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't, this, isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James? Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? So you see James here, right? That's the James who wrote the book of James. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus' family didn't always believe in him as the Messiah. Do you remember the story where Jesus was performing uh, miracles and his family came up to them to get his attention and someone tapped on his shoulder and said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers and sisters are here to talk to you. And Jesus looked at the crowd and he said, these are my mothers and brothers and sisters. Well, in Mark 3, 21, it says, when his family heard about this, they wanted to take charge of him, and they said, he is out of his mind. (laughs) Do you ever think about your family members like that? 
I think this is interesting because James was a part of this. John 7, 5 says, For not even his brothers were believing in him. So I think this is very important because this included James. For most of Jesus' ministry, James really didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to James. And it was such a miraculous encounter. James' life was changed by the power of resurrection life that we talk about here. That he became one of the greatest leaders in the early church movement. And he wrote one of the most powerful books on Christian action. Calling Christians to take their faith seriously. So that gives a little more context now, doesn't it? James now identifies as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote this book to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. I came back to the, this verse and I changed um, the translation. The other one said scattered among the nations. But it was known as the dispersion. So that's his audience. He's writing to people who have been scattered. Why were they scattering? It, it would be like us just scattering. They were facing persecution. It was very hard to profess Christianity. So people were drifting away from the faith. Christians started bickering. And they actually became very unproductive. They're scattered, unproductive, falling away, drifting. And so James is whipping them back into shape. And I think that, I feel like in our country, we're in a dispersion ourselves. Do you sense that? We are in one of the most unchurched Seasons in the last few decades, I feel, people are drifting and falling away. There is scores and scores of unchurched people in the U.S. There's also division and bickering, and there's a lot of unproductiveness. So, in light of his audience, I actually think that this book is conducive to our own dispersion here in the U.S. and even in our valley. So, that's the audience that James is writing to, people in the dispersion. Now, here's the theme, the theme of the book. I was reading Charles Swindle, um, his commentary, and here's a sentence, a couple of sentences that shows us the theme of James. This is what he says. Real faith produces genuine works. If, you've, if you say you've come to know the Lord Jesus then that should be reflected in your life. Pretty straightforward, right? Pretty simple. Real faith produces genuine works. If you say you've come to know the Lord Jesus, then that should be reflected by your life. Now again, James is assuming that you already get the way to God. You already get grace and his mercy and his love, the gospel of salvation, all the basic things. He knows that you get it. He's assuming that. Now he's just being honest about how this works. And so don't let the hardships that you're going through in your life right now pull you away from your faith. Actually, what we're going to see in the text today is all of the hardships and all the trials that you are experiencing are actually designed to make you stronger and form you into the person God wants you to be if you will allow it, okay? So the audience is Christians who are being dispersed. And the theme is real faith produces genuine works. Now the theme verse, which we're not going to get into for a while, I think is James 2.14. This is the famous verse. If you grew up in church, you've heard this a lot. What good is it, my brothers and sisters? If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? In other words, is your conversion real? Are you a real Christian if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but you're not following him? Or there's no fruit in your life? I know it's harsh. I know it's straightforward, but that's the thing. So these people, his audience, weren't acting like it. That's why he had to write this to them. 
Real faith produces genuine works. Again, we'll get to that later, but that's the theme. So as we go through the book of James in the next 11 weeks or so, we're basically hitting different topics, which are different examples of that. So that's what you can understand. Every sermon shows different examples of how real faith produces genuine works. So here's the title of today's sermon. Testing of your faith, part one, trials. Because that's the section title. Next week will be testing of your faith, part two, temptations. And then again, week three, I've asked Dave Gordon to speak into your life, and I'll be here, I'll introduce him, and I'll tell you why I've asked him to be here. Then the fourth week, we're still going to be in James chapter one, that famous section where it says, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word, okay? The testing of your faith, part one, trials. How many of you, at some distant point in the past, experienced trials? Not today. Not that you're going through trials today, but at some point in the past. Okay, who's going through trials? Come on, be real. We all do. Every single one of us do. In fact, all throughout the scriptures, everybody goes through trials. I'll give you three examples in surveying scripture, and you tell me if you relate to this or if you agree. Job. Remember Job? Lost his children, his family, got a horrible disease. Just the worst kind of life you can think about. Managed to keep his faith and stay steadfast and worship God. This is what he said. Man is short-lived and full of turmoil. Do you agree? What about David? In the Psalms, he said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Do you agree? Thank you for your honesty. What about Paul in the New Testament? We are afflicted in every way. Perplexed, persecuted, struck down. Do you agree? It's been said that Paul's life journey was like a deer wounded running through the woods, bleeding everywhere that he goes. Paul is a perfect example of facing constant affliction. Did you ever get little scrapes and bruises as a kid running through the woods? Too many, many, right? So many scrapes and bruises, my kids get them all the time. How many of you know as adults, we we still get scrapes and bruises, but they're a lot deeper than the skin, aren't they? We still bleed, but it's on the inside. We carry a lot of wounds in our hearts. And so what I hope that you see today, so this is my sentence. You can write it down if you like or just keep it in your mind. Your trials are not just hardships. They are tests that form you into maturity. That's what I want you to walk away with today. Your trials are not just hardships. They are tests that form you into maturity. And so now we're going to jump into the text that Angie read this morning. Thank you for doing that. Let's pray, and then we'll dive into our text for today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that you have given us this text. You've given us this book. Because you love us. Because you are always inviting us into a loving friendship with you. And you want us to know this love and enjoy this love in our everyday walking around lives. And you show us texts like this to pull us out of are drifting away from you and and pulling us into a living, breathing, interactive relationship with you. Even the texts that are hard, 
I pray that we would see them as your love for us, the way that a father disciplines his child. I pray that it would engage our minds, but I pray that it would descend into our hearts because that is where real change occurs. I pray that you would teach us what we are to do in response to the text, in participation with your power, because we cannot change ourselves. Christ alone is the power to change lives. But teach us how to posture ourselves and participate with you. How do we respond to the word that is spoken to us today if we are in fact your people? We pray that you would lead us in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. All right, here we go. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Angie read patience. I love that. Another word is endurance. Just curious, how many of you, maybe if you grew up in church, have heard this your entire life or a very long time? (laughs) Vince drops his head, yep. Kids church, man, I've heard this my whole life. How easy is it to forget this? Something so simple yet so powerful. In Charles Swindle's commentary on these verses and their sermon notes today in the app and also in your worship guide that was handed out, He said, there's two things that we need to know about trials. The first is that they are inevitable. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. And we see it from verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. What does the next word say? Whenever you face trials or when you face trials. He didn't say if you face trials. It says when you face trials. So trials are inevitable. Suffering is inevitable for human beings, Christian or not. Have you heard this verse in 1 Peter 4, 12, where it says, when you're going through trials, don't be surprised as if something strange were happening to you? Jesus said, in this world, in this present age, you will have tribulation, but take heart because I've overcome the world. That's why we did a whole series on the kingdom of God so that we could see the bigger, larger story. They are inevitable. So don't buy into the lie that Christian maturity or, you know, attaining kind of a more mature posture as a Christian is a spiritual Disneyland. Okay, that it's perfect and magical. Okay, Disneyland isn't even perfect. It costs money. Your feet hurt. The characters are fake. I'm sorry to break it to you. I know this because when I was little, five or six, I pulled on Tigger's tail. And it was not Tigger. He was, he was too sweet. He's like, oh, don't pull my tail. I was like, you're an imposter. Christianity is not a spiritual Disneyland. Trials are inevitable. Now, the word consider... It is implying a change of your mindset. Okay, it's not saying that trials are joyful. Trials are not joyful. When was the last time you enjoyed getting into an argument with your spouse? You don't enjoy having conflict. I see spouses looking at their husbands. I like it. You don't enjoy getting into conflict with your friends. It's not joyful going to work every day to a job that you hate. It's not joyful to deal with negative thoughts and emotions. Scripture is calling us to change our mindset. Okay, that's the content of today's message. So they are inevitable. But number two, they have purpose. Your trials have purpose. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
It's telling us to let perseverance finish its work. Allow the trials so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the trials that you go through have a purpose because they're actually developing more endurance in you. And if you don't quit in the middle of the process and allow endurance to take effect, it'll actually lead to a more completeness in your spiritual life, a holisticness. I've been hearing a phrase. I don't know if it's been around a long time or if I'm just hearing it. Have you heard of this phrase going around called quiet quitting? Quiet quitting? So it's when you're working at a job and you've lost heart. You don't want to work there anymore. And so you kind of quit a little bit, even though you can't quit because you need the income. So what you do is you just do the bare minimum. You just do the bare minimum to get by. Well, I think that that this is what happened to the Jews in the dispersion. And I think that this is what happens in our dispersion today is people are quiet quitting their spirituality. So the opposite of quiet quitting is perseverance. So I just want to ask you in your heart of hearts, if you reflect down to your deepest desires, do you desire endurance? Do you want that? Do you want a spiritual endurance in your life? I think you do. I do. We all do. If you do, allow trials in your life. Give space for that. Give grace for that. Let perseverance finish its work. Allow the trials. So it's a part of the forming process. So if you'll change your mindset and consider it joy, because this is actually an opportunity. Easier said than done, right? But the trials we go through are opportunities to grow into maturity. The word testing actually means approval. Have you guys ever watched any movies where you see a blacksmith and he's in his shop and there's the, I don't know, what is it, magma or something? And there's a sword and it's red hot, and it's, I wish I, I should have did my research to know the terminologies. What's the black thing you put the sword on? Anvil. Say it again. Anvil. 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 Thanks. So you put the sword on it, and you hit it with a hammer. So every time the sword gets hit with a hammer, it's being tested, right? But it's also being formed, Every time the hammer hits the sword, it's being tested, and it's being formed, and eventually it's approved. So the trials that you're going through, they're testing you, they're forming you, so that you can be approved. Not approval like God's only going to approve of you if you do these things. But we're talking about Christian maturity. So this is kind of a new perspective. So the next time you say, man, I'm just going through a hardship right now. Say, no, I'm going through a test. Or man, we just had this huge blow up at work. There's so much conflict with our managers and the staff. It's not a hardship. It's a test. It's a test that is forming you. So a good test of kind of the progress of your faith is to think about how you reacted to that. Are you sulking and you're bitter over that conflict? Or were you able to allow it to inform you about your character and how it is being used to form you? You can tell a lot about the progress of someone's faith by the way they handle trials or yourself. You can tell a lot about the progress of your faith by the way, you handle trials. Now, of course, there's grace for the journey. But as we've said, this is real talk. The word perseverance means to abide under. Isn't that the goal? To abide in Christ. To be content in our spiritual walk with Jesus. That's why verse 4 says, 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, so far what we've learned from the text very simply is that trials are inevitable and they have purpose. And so the goal then of persevering through whatever it is you're going through is Christian maturity. Now I sent uh, an email out this week. I'll talk more about this, but next year, we're going to spend an entire year, we'll unveil the annual theme, the name of the theme. I still want to talk to my staff a little bit about it. But we're going to go through an entire year of Christian maturity. Now the theological term for that is sanctification. So if you've ever heard of the word justification, that talks about the way to God. Sanctification talks about our walk with God. Now, I use the term soul health. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? It's sanctification. Sanctification of the whole person, the spirit, mind, and body. I'm actually going to be making a video about it. A few weeks ago, we had a technical error, and I wanted to show you some slides, and I couldn't. But it worked out because I'm going to make a video. The week that my friend Dave Gordon is sharing with you, I'm going to make a video. I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to e-blast it. I'm going to run some ads on social media and just create as much awareness as I can about what we're going to be doing together next year because I'm very excited about it. Okay. Let's read what we just went through in one sitting. Four verses. Whew, it's a lot. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Very simple. So now I'm going to give you three applications for today in your sermon notes. Very simple, directly from the text. So this is what we want to do. One of my favorite verses is Nehemiah 8.8, 8, I think. In the Old Testament, it said they read from the word of God and they gave the meaning so that the people who heard understood what it meant. And so that's what we're going to be doing in the series. We're going to read the text and I'll give you some application directly from the text. So this isn't three ideas from Daniel. That's the last thing you need. This is from the reading today. So number one, know that your testing produces endurance. Know that your testing produces endurance. So the text today is calling us to change our minds about all the various kinds of trials that we go through and see them not just as hardships, but as tests that form us and prepare us for endurance. So that's number one. Number two is know that your endurance leads to completeness. That's what the text told us. So the goal of persevering through trials and not quitting the goal of persevering is so that we can be formed into Christian maturity, which just means health. We're healthier. Now, I want you to see the sequence here. It's very important. Testing. See the word testing? Testing, it's like a wall. It's a barrier. If you get through that, testing leads to endurance. And endurance leads to completeness. That's why James said, consider it pure joy. The trials aren't joy, but we can consider it as joy when we know that testing leads to endurance and endurance leads to completeness. Now, many people stop at the testing. There's a really good book I read called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It talks about kind of the stages of faith. I don't know if I remember them all. But, you know, you get saved and you get excited. And then, number two, you get on a pathway of discipleship. Number three, you start serving. And then you hit a wall. A lot of people hit a wall, whether it's early on in your faith, later on in your faith. People always hit a wall. And that wall, it's either going to break you or it's going to send you into the inner journey. 
It's called the next stage is the inward journey. We start to learn to live from the heart. And that is what permeates through the formation dimensions. We'll talk about that next year toward holistic soul health. But many people stop at the testing. The test comes and they fall away. Or the test comes and, man, they get discouraged and they drift away. Or worse, they disperse. Congregationally, I think the pandemic was a big test for our whole country, for the world. And a lot of us dispersed. What did Jesus say about building your house? If your house is built on, a sand, on the sand when the storms of life come, it's obviously unstable and it falls. But when we learn to build our house on the bedrock of Jesus, the storms come. Are you getting it? So the testing leads to endurance and endurance leads to completeness. So I just want to encourage you, I don't know what you're going through, but I know it's something. Don't give up before reaching maturity. Swindle said it like this, don't cut the process short that's leading to your maturity. Don't cut the process short. Let perseverance finish its work. Allow the trial so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So in transition, I want to ask this question, why do we not have endurance? Sometimes, we all do, me too. Why do we not have endurance? Why do we, sometimes we kind of drift off, we fall away, and we lack this completeness. Again, it's not a spiritual Disneyland, so we're not trying to obtain this like perfection, but, but why do we struggle with endurance and completeness? Well, we learn in the very next verse. This may not be, it is, it is in here, I apologize. The very next verse, verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom... There's the first reason. That's the first reason right there. We lack wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So the first reason is we often fail to endure and kind of, um, you know, live more healthy spiritually is we start to lack wisdom in our lives. It happens to us all the time. But there's another reason. Verse 6 through 8. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. So there's our second problem. We doubt. So when we start to lack wisdom in life, we start doubting. That's when that happens. So ask for wisdom, James said. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. That's some straight talk, right? We often fail. I often fail to endure. I often fail to feel and be healthier spiritually when we have our seasons. We go back and forth. And the moments when I fail to endure and be more complete is when I lack wisdom and I start doubting. That is when we're blown around and we're tossed and we don't receive what we need. We're double-minded and unstable in all we do. So now I want us to isolate that last phrase in the text together. Just isolate those words. A person who lacks wisdom and is doubting. Okay, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So that phrase there, double-minded, it just means that you have your mind on two things. It's really a conflict of two wills. So it's really double-willed. So if you remember the overarching theme of our series on the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God is the rule of God, the reign or the governance of God for our good. It's an environment, it's a habitat. Dallas Willard said, the kingdom of God is the effective range of his will cosmically. It's the effective range of his will, where what he wants done is done. 
Next year, when we talk about the soul and the formation dimension, spirit, mind, emotion, thoughts, body, social context, all that, the center of the person is a will. The center of the person is the will. So the problem is that we want both. We want God's will to be done, but sometimes we want our will to be done, right? We want to serve two masters. And so the reason that we struggle with spiritual formation or what we're talking about, uh, sanctification, soul health, is because we have our mind in two different places. Now this is very important. I'll give you a very mini lesson on the mind. We'll do an entire sermon on it next year. We'll spend more time on it. But the mind is the spiritual receptor of your soul. It's where ideas come into your mind, it goes into your heart, and that shapes your beliefs, feelings, ultimately your behaviors and the outcomes of your life. So it's like air traffic control at the airport. Air traffic control receives information, right? And then it communicates. This is one of my favorite quotes from Dallas Willard, and I don't know it perfectly, but the the idea is so important. So spiritual formation or sanctification or soul health is basically receiving ideas and images. Every day we receive ideas and images that shape us. What we want to do is replace the ideas and images with the ideas and the images that fill the mind of Christ. So we are to have the mind of Christ. And we'll get to this in a few weeks. But James says... Receive the word of God implanted, which has the power to save your soul. Not justification salvation, not the way salvation. We're talking about the walk, sanctification. Has the power to save your soul health. A lot of times we need our walk saved. So James is assuming that you understand the way. He's talking about our walk. He's being real. If you are... Letting your mind and your will on the things of the world, you're going to be double-minded. So it's the natural result to be unstable. And so the antidote, according to the text, is to have wisdom and to have faith, which obviously comes as we engage in his word. And we'll get more into that later. But number three, well, number one is know that your testing produces endurance. Number two, know that your endurance leads to completeness. But number three, ask God for wisdom and faith. Because lacking wisdom and doubting is our problem. There's so much more. Like formation and reading our Bibles, there's so much more to this that we get to later, but I'm only giving you application from today's text. And James teaches us today, not later, but today, that we need to ask God for wisdom and we need to ask him for faith. And that's what I want to ask you to do. So let's finish it up here. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. This verse shows us that all of us, whether rich or poor, we all have trials. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. So that's their trial. Whether you're struggling financially or you're feeling lowly, consider it joy. Okay, so that's a category. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich... This is a warning not against richness, but the deceitfulness of wealth. And that's another sermon also. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away while they go about their business. Even the rich is needy. There's no one who's not struggling with needs. Again, we'll have a sermon dedicated to wealth, how it's not evil, but dangerous. Whether you're rich or poor, lowly or elevated, humble or proud, you have trials. And we're simply learning today, allow the trials to happen, to happen, because they're forming you. 
And we're going to end with verse 12 today. Next week, we'll pick up in verse 13. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's a summation verse, isn't it? Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So if you will persevere through whatever it is that's weighing you down right now. First of all, Jesus invites you. He wants to take that burden from you. But with him, if you will persevere through trials, you'll be blessed. It says it very clearly. If you will persevere under trial. We try our best to avoid legalism because we want to do that. Life change does not happen by behavioral change. That's why our first plumb line says, Christ alone is the power to change lives. But our second one says, but healthy spirituality requires healthy habits. So we have to put some stake in the game. We have to participate with Jesus. So there is some persevering under trial that we have to do. But you will receive the crown of life in this life. Yes, if you persevere and you don't renounce your faith and lose your faith in Jesus, yes, you will receive the crown of life someday. But this is letting you know that right now, okay, a crown represents the pinnacle of glory and royalty. You will receive the crown of life in this life if you'll persevere. You will be blessed That's the life that we're talking about in the kingdom of God. And we're going to wrap it up right there. I'm actually going to leave you with the first verse. The way we started, we're going to end. James, a servant of God, And of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Maybe you're here today and you're at a place in your spiritual life. You get the way to God. You get that. But you're struggling with your walk with God. Maybe you've been dispersed or maybe you've felt scattered. I want to invite you to come back home. You are always being invited by Jesus into a loving friendship. God loves you. You are always being invited into a loving friendship with the Holy Trinity. Another kind of life is here and you are being invited into it. And I want to invite you to join us. This fall is going to be very exciting. Next year is going to be even more exciting as we grow together. So let's unite around God's word together. I'm actually going to call Mia's grandfather up here. Uh, Ray was encouraging some of the staff a few weeks ago, and it really inspired me. Um, So yesterday I texted him. I said, will you share that with our church family and then pray for us? And he said, I will be available. So let's welcome our dear friend, Ray, to the stage. Thank you, Daniel. These scriptures that I'm about to read were shared with me. And the Holy Spirit just moved in me when I heard, heard these scriptures. I thought it was what the, what the church has gone through in the last two years, I thought this was so relevant for where the church is now today. So I'm going to go ahead and read these scriptures. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. 
my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrows have found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord, host, my King, my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is you. I believe right now that the house of God, that the Spirit is calling people back into the house of God. These people, they journeyed. It says, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. These people were excited in their journey. They didn't think about the journey. They didn't think about the time it took to get to their destination, the house of the Lord. They just knew they had to get there. And only a, an elect few, a group, could only enter into the courts and enter into the tab tabernacle. But this group didn't care about that. Their heart's desire was to get to the house of the Lord. Their desire was to just to look upon it. They, they were envious of even the sparrows that made, made their nest up in the eaves of the tabernacle, of the, of the temple, of the house of the Lord. But none of that bothered them because their heart's desire was to be in the house of the Lord. I believe the Spirit is calling them back to the house of the Lord. We forget exactly what was given to us at the very beginning. Our love was lost. We, he's calling you back to that first love. You know, when you're coming down from the 10 freeway, coming up from the 10 freeway, and you hit Cook Street, your heart would be, should be saying, I'm getting close to the house of the Lord. I'm excited because I want to know what the Lord has for me. I want to hear what's being shared from the altar it's exciting. I want to know. when you, the, You've got your own parking lot out there. You ought to be just praising God. Yeah, my parking lot is here for me. I want to be there. I can't wait to get into the front doors where that big welcome sign is. Yes. You see, our first love that our mate, our spouse, he or she, we were, we were there ahead of time, just knowing we were going to have a date with them. We were there early. We were dressed to impress. We had an attitude of gratitude. Even, it, even when starting your first day at the job, you were there early. You wanted to impress. You wanted to make sure, you know, you knew what you were doing. You wanted to get all the instructions that you could do so that you could do that good job. I believe the Spirit's saying, where is our relationship? Is it a priority? Do you really want to hear what the Spirit is saying? He's calling you back. He knows that the world that we live in is a dark place, uncertain of what might be coming tomorrow, of all the trials and temptations that we've just read. He's calling you back in to come back before the altar, to take these burdens off of what you've been carrying, there's nothing, to, there's nothing like being in the house of the Lord. You know, it's good to watch it on any kind of type of screen. It's good. But to be in, with the, in the house of the Lord with the other believers, sharing your testimony of the week, what God has done in your life, sharing what he did with your family, crying before the altars because he is so good. He's calling you back in. He's saying, in before the altar is where you belong. The God of our salvation, grab the horns of the altar. Decide in your heart right now, what is your priority? Your job, your bank account, the one with your spouse, or is it 
to the spirit that's calling you back in. I'm going to end with a prayer, but before I do that, if the prayer partners would come up. He's calling you that's sitting out here to bring your burdens, to bring that baggage, to bring all the disappointment, the hurt from this dysfunctional world. And he wants you to leave it right here. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When you come in through that welcome sign and make yourself comfortable and listen to what the Lord is, get the word of truth is being dispersed from the altar. You won't walk out those doors the same person. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the truth that you're sharing with us. We thank you for the truth that you're teaching us. Father, we recognize you as the Lord of our salvation. We shall wait upon you all day long. Father, there is none in heaven like you. And in this earth, we desire no one else but you. Father, you are our Lord and our Savior. Father, in this word, in the end, these that are journeying, saying, one day in the house of the Lord isn't, isn't like a thousand elsewhere. Just one day in your presence, in the house of the Lord, isn't like anything, a thousand elsewhere. Father, I pray all that hear the sound of my voice will listen to the Spirit and obey. And we just praise you and thank you for the things that you're doing in your people's lives. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.